Good morning. Today we'll be talking about the essay The Beauty Industry by Aldous Huxley. To talk about the author, Aldous Huxley was an English writer, a short story writer, essayist, poet, novelist, and he was a scriptwriter for many movies when he was in Hollywood. He lived from 1894 to 1963. and he has witnessed both the world wars which have had a great influence on his ideology and philosophies he graduated from balliol college oxford and later in his life he moved from england to us in 1937 under the influence of swami prabhavananda He was greatly attached to the Vedanta philosophy of the East and he got an opportunity to write an introduction to Bhagavad Gita the song of god which was translated by Swami Prabhavananda Being a philosopher he was interested in finding out the commonalities of eastern and western mysticism which he has written in his book the perennial philosophy another important aspect about the author is that he lost his eyesight due to a disease when he was in his teens he remained blind for 2 or 3 years and after which he recovered and throughout his life he continued to have partial eyesight So when the army was recruiting people to the first world war he was rejected for being uh, physically disabled His major works include include Brave New World Island Point Counterpoint The Doors of Perception The Perennial Philosophy The Devils of Loden He is known much for the for the is uh, for the novel brave new world which is a dystopian novel and set in the futuristic uh, world he talks about how science starts controlling the lives of people his other novels have also gained wide popularity moving to the essay the beauty industry Initially the author begins by saying the context of the essay. He says that it was written uh, he he says that he wishes to talk about the beauty industry during the great economic depression of the 1930s. Even when most of the countries were affected by this great economic depression of the 30s, the only industry that flourished in the US was the beauty industry. He takes a statistic and says that the American women of those times were found to be spending almost 3 million pounds a week on beauty and beauty products which accounts up to 156 million pounds a year which he says is only half the revenue of India. The reference to India here is interesting because that shows Aldous Huxley's idea of India as a third world country. Then he moves on to talk about the condition of the beauty industry all over Europe. He says that Europe was poorer than America in terms of wealth, but even then in Europe also the beauty industry seemed to be flourishing. He talks about the great impact that the advertisements had on the beauty industry. How people started rushing to buy beauty products based on the advertisements he moves on to talk about the idea of the modern cult of beauty from the introduction he has given he says that beauty cannot be seen exclusively as a function of wealth if it if beauty was or beauty industry flourished just on the basis of wealth then it would not have flourished during the economic depression he says that it is not a matter of economic prosperity alone 
but there have been other factors that have led to the flourishing of beauty industry. The first of that, he says, is the status of women. Women were seen to be more freer than before. They had the freedom to do, not only do the things which were reserved for men, but they also had the freedom or the privilege to be more feminine and, or attractive. They took upon themselves the rights of the body to be strong and beautiful. So to do a makeup or to do a makeover and to be attractive, attempting to be attractive was seen to be a right of a woman. So this has basically led to the flourishing of beauty industry in the US and Europe. He says that he moves on to say that the women also started exercising the right to look less virtuous. He gives two examples to elaborate on this point. He says that the women, the modern women, they took the right to be less virtuous than their grandmothers. Now what about the grandmothers? If you recollect, the grandmothers used to be examples of simplicity. There was not much of a beauty consciousness among the grandmothers, most of them at least. So that is the virtuous virtue that he's talking about here, simplicity. But coming to the modern generation, he says, they take upon themselves, the women take upon themselves the right to look less virtuous. So simplicity has moved out of sight. Similarly, the next example he gives is that of a British matron. As you can see in the images given, the two images on top are images of two British matrons. Matrons are the senior nurses in a hospital. They are supposed to have all the powers in the hospital. They were assumed powerful. They also uh, had the right to do whatever amendments they wanted to do in the hospital. So they were always characterized by seriousness and a terrific aspect. But coming to the modern age, he says, even the British matrons have taken the freedom to be more beautiful. The image that is given below of that beautiful matron shows how uh, the idea of beauty has changed even for the British matrons. To quote Huxley, he says that the, they took upon themselves the concession to the body with a large B to the mannequin principle of evil. Now what is this mannequin principle? Mannequin principle refers to the dualistic religious movement. They talk about the binaries of spirit and body, good and evil. So attempting to beautify the body was considered to be equivalent to something evil. So that aspect, that idea of the body, uh, beautifying the body as evil was uh, removed during this period. He says that the women started exercising the freedom to be more beautiful and they took it upon themselves as their right to be more beautiful. He moves on to talk about the result of this modern cult of beauty. Now what has it come to? He talks about a success side to this modern cult of beauty and also a failure side to this. He says that the success is that women can retain their youthful appearance. So-called old ladies, they become extinct. Women succumbing to the skin foods, the injections of paraffins, you know, wax, facial surgery, mud baths and paint, they are successful enough to retain their youthful appearance. To make it more humorous, he says that the portrait of the artist's mother in the future would be the same as the portrait of the artist's daughter. Portrait of the artist's mother is a reference, is an allusion to a painting by Van Gogh. 
That's the painting given on top in the image. Portrait of the artist's daughter is another portrait, another painting drawn by Francis Boucher. He says that if this trend of the modern cult of beauty continues, then the portrait of the artist's mother would look the same as the portrait of the artist's daughter. He then moves on to contrast between beauty and ugliness. He says that beauty is always seen to be a symptom of health and ugliness as a symptom of disease. So a person who is not healthy looks to be ugly. A person who is healthy would look to be beauty, beautiful. So this contrast between beauty and ugliness, even that contrast, even the way it symbolizes health, even that should be doubted, he says. Because if beauty can be made, if the beauty can be made up on the faces of women, then it would no longer, ugliness would no longer be there and the disease would not be uh, symptomized. He moves on to say that the real beauty is an affair of the inner self. No matter how much ever women try to beautify themselves on the outside, if she is not beautiful within, if that affair of the inner self is not perfect, then the real beauty fades. He gives an example of a porcelain jar. He says the beauty of the jar, of this porcelain jar, is a matter of shape, of color, of surface texture. So the jar may be empty or it might be uh, occupied by spiders or it might be full of honey or stinking slime, whatever it be. It makes no difference to the beauty of the outside. He says that women's beauty, women who focus on the external beauty, are only skin deep beautiful. Inner beauty refers to the purity of the spirit. To court him, he says, there is an interior light that can transfigure forms that the pure aesthetician would regard as imperfect or downright ugly. So this interior light, this purity of the spirit is what makes a woman beautiful, not the external form. He moves on to say, he moves on to talk about the psychological ugliness. Women who are externally beautiful, who seem to be externally beautiful, need not be beautiful inside. It need not be the ugliness uh, of the external self, but it is the ugliness of stupidity, unawareness or ignorance. You might have noted the beauty contests which not only focus on the external beauty but also about their awareness of the matters around them. So if that is not perfect, then the woman cannot be considered beautiful, he says. So ugliness is not just merely of the external nature but it is also psychological. If a woman is stupid, if a woman is unaware of the things happening around her, if she is ignorant about the things happening around her, she can be deemed ugly. There is also the ugliness of greed, ugliness of lustful nature, ugliness of extreme greed for wealth. So if a woman is uh, seen to have all these qualities, then no matter how beautiful she is outside, she projects herself as ugly. To demonstrate this, he gives the example of two American girls that he met in North Africa. He calls, to court him, he calls them exquisite creatures and he talks about them that they were positively repulsive. They had an air of hardness, he says. There is no compassion, there is no humanity on their face because their humanity is covered by the overpainting that they have done to their face. So he refers to this group of women who are internally dead, internally hard and that is some sign of their emotional disharmony. So this he says is the failure of the modern cult of beauty because outward beauty, outside beauty does not or it never touches the deepest source of beauty or the experiencing soul. He concludes it by saying the real secret to be beautiful 
lies in the ability to live harmoniously and peacefully. So he comes to this conclusion and says that beauty is not just a matter of external, it, it's not just a matter of the outside, but it is also a matter of the inside. So rather than trying to be beautiful outside, he says, to be beautiful, you need to be pure in soul. You need to be harmonious with your soul, to be peaceful with your soul. Overall, he deals, uh, he has this uh, aim of dismantling the idea of beauty. He says how external beauty become worthless if the woman is not beautiful inside. The style he has used is quite persuasive in nature because he has his own argument which he is trying to uh, elaborate based on certain examples and based on his own views, point of view. He uses humor and satire in order to explain his point. Uh, this essay can be looked at as a satire because it exposes the hypocrisy of the idea of being beautiful, the overpainting, the uh, the idea that you are beautiful when you paint yourself on the outside, that is being questioned, that is being exposed. He uses the analogy of a porcelain jar to explain uh, that a woman, a woman who tries to be beautiful on the outside is like a porcelain jar. We don't know what inhabits the inside of the jar, but outside the outward beauty is always shown. There are also allusions to two paintings, the portrait of the artist mother and portrait of the artist daughter. Uh, there are allusions to these paintings to uh, validate his point. There is also the allusion to the British matron. So overall, uh, he seems to be writing from a very patriarchal uh, point of view. Uh, he talks about the idea of beauty as not simply from the outside, but it is also a matter of the inside. So that way he concludes the uh, essay. Thank you.